introduce you the first speaker of, of the bootcamp, uh, Monty Slatkin. It's really great pleasure to have him speak to us. Uh, as many of you know, Monty has made numerous profound and long-lasting contributions to theoretical evolutionary biology. And, and, we are, and he's actually a, a, a role model to many of us, including myself. And we are really lucky to have him tell us about the historical development of evolutionary biology. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to, um, to be asked to give the opening lectures. I will say, uh, first of all, I'm, a, I'm trained as a mathematician. I'm, I've worked in evolutionary biology for a long time, but I've never actually studied evolutionary biology. So, but I have taught evolution for non-majors many times. And what I, will t what I will cover in my first lecture is the history of Darwinism through neo-Darwinism and the uh, later developments. And then in the sec second lecture, I'll talk specifically about the history of population genetics, not the theory of population genetics, which Steve Evans and, his, and others will, will discuss later today, but the, in, focusing largely on empirical studies in population genetics. Now, to, to begin, uh, any proper discussion of evolution begins with this book, The Origin of Species, by Charles Darwin, published in 1859. The main reason I put this title page is to make sure you know what the title is. It is On the Origin of Species. It is not, as many people think mistakenly, On the Origin of the Species. It's not about the evolution of humans. It's about evolution. Now, when it was published in 1859, this book created a scientific revolution on a par with the Copernican revolution of astronomy or the germ theory of disease. It had a profound effect on thinking in the latter part of the 19th century. It was very controversial and to some extent still is very controversial. Nevertheless, even people who argue vigorously about it aren't entirely clear sometimes on what actually Darwin's theory of evolution is. And so I will follow Steve Gould in distinguishing three parts of what's in the origin. First of all, there is the fact of evolution. That is, evolution occurred. What he, Darwin didn't call it that. He called it descent with modification. But it means the same thing. That is, species evolved from something else. And Darwin emphasized that there, were prob there was probably one or only a few common ancestors. And from these few common ancestors, or, or one, the div diversity of life evolved somehow. That's the fact of evolution, that evolution occurred. The second part of Darwin's theory is that he proposed a specific pattern of evolution. Not only did evolution occur, but it occurred in a specific way. It occurred slowly, gradually, and so slowly that it was imperceptible when viewing living things at any one time from a human perspective. So even though evolution occurred, you don't see it occurring. He had to, after all, account for that fact. We don't see species changing every day, or at least we people didn't think so until they looked very closely. So there's a pattern of evolution. You could believe the fact of evolution, but not Darwin's pattern. You could, for example, think that instead of gradual evolution, there was what people did and still call saltational evolution, where there was no change or very slow change, and then suddenly, in, at once, a species changed into something else. So that, logically, that's a distinct pattern, even though you accept the pattern of evolution, even though you accept the fact of evolution. Finally, Darwin proposed a mechanism evolution, of evolution, namely that evolution occurred by, by the continued action of natural selection. And natural selection acted on heritable variation that was present in all species. So some of the difference between individuals affected their survival and reproduction. Those differences were inherited, and inevitably, natural selection 
would result in a change in the species composition. His focus was not on the individual. His focus was on the population or the species. He didn't always make that distinction. Um, once again, you could accept the fact of evolution, you could accept the pattern of evolution, but you could reject natural selection, which people generally don't do, or you could th question the sufficiency of natural selection. When Darwin proposed natural selection, I think most people who viewed it thought that was obvious. It was something that because he built on what people knew about the selection acting, artificial selection performed on domesticated plants and animals, he simply generalized it in the same way that Newton generalized the force of gravitation on Earth to account for the celestial movements of the sun and the moon. He generalized the action of artificial selection to create long-term changes. And many, uh, Thomas Huxley, for example, said when he, he, after he read the book, how extremely stupid of me not to have thought of that. It's an obvious idea. So I don't think many people questioned whether natural selection could work, whether it could cause evolution to occur. But it's a different question to say natural selection is the only mechanism causing evolution to occur. Darwin was very, very clear in saying that, that natural selection was sufficient. It was the only thing causing change. Now, Darwin's pattern, but these, of course, these ideas were not independent, and Darwin did not present them as independent ideas. Before people would accept the fact of evolution, he had to have a plausible mechanism. And there, uh, Darwin was also clear, if, if change is slow and gradual and continuous, and if natural selection accounted for all change, a necessary consequence is that at every point, at every time, change occurred because there was an immediate improvement by, by the action of natural selection. So when you have a transition between major forms. For example, transition from non-flying animals to flying animals, or from swimming animals to land-based walking animals. What we regard as major transitions that we know had to have occurred because we have both non-flying and flying organisms, we have both swimming and walking organisms, and so on. Every intermediate step had to be an improvement Natural selection had to be acting at every time to cause the change, to cause swimming organisms to continually improve and become land-based organisms. So that's a consequence of, of that. And Darwin was very clear in, in the origin saying, if it could be proved that a transition occurred in spite of the action of natural selection, so that the intermediate forms were less well adapted than the ancestral forms, then that would disprove his theory. And he was very clear in the origin about having the fact of evolution and the separate creation of species as alternative hypotheses that he continually tested. Much of the origin is a long argument for evolution versus what we, what we would call creationism, separate creation of species that then no longer change. Now Darwin was by no means the first person to propose that evolution occurred. Many, many people discussed it uh, in, in various forms. And Lamarck, more than 50 years before, proposed a fairly complete theory of evolution. He, his theory said evolution occurred that organisms, the pattern of evolution uh, was not as complete as Darwin's, but he proposed that species increased in their degree of perfection. And furthermore, that there was an internal striving for perfection, and those individuals that were most successful in striving transmitted the changes that occurred during their lifetime to their offspring, something we now call the inheritance of, of, of acquired characters or Lamarckian evolution. 
there were lots of evolutionary theories before Darwin. Darwin's book was most was uniquely successful, though, because at first it was very convincing. He amassed a large amount of evidence. He presented it in a very persuasive way, and it was a very complete theory. He didn't ignore all the facts. He covered the geological record, the geographic distribution of species. He dealt with what he saw as potential objections to the theory of his theory of evolution, and so on. So it was a very convincing case. You couldn't just dismiss it without taking on a body of evidence that he amassed and dismiss that or parts of that. Nevertheless, it wasn't, and when it was proposed, suddenly evolutionary thinking was was part of the intellectual universe. This figure is the only figure from the origin, and it illustrates the gradual pattern in Darwin's, Darwin's view of, of evolution. There are no saltational changes. That is, there are no jumps here that then lead to a, a new group. He was quite clear that some, some organisms didn't change very much. They didn't leave any ancestors. Others left very few, and others left Many. He was also very clear that extinction was an important part of the process. Now, after The Origin was published, it was, the evolutionary ideas were discussed in great, at great length. And there were several serious challenges. I mean, there were other, other challenges that were based on simply, it can't be true. Uh, Bishop Wilberforce's wife is, is reported to have said, I hope it's not true, and if it is true, I hope it doesn't become generally known. Um, but there were serious, serious challenges by, by very reputable people that had to be taken seriously and which did influence Darwin's thinking and did influence the development of evolutionary biology. The first, one of the first, came from William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, very eminent a uh, physicist and founder of one of the developers of the theory of thermodynamics. And part of, Darwin, part of Darwin's theory is that there was essentially unlimited time available for evolution to occur. So extremely slow processes could work for a long time producing the diversity of life we see today. And he, he got this view from Lyell, a geologist who, who proposed it earlier in the 19th century. Uh, Thompson said, no, this can't be true. There isn't a, un, an unlimited amount of time because the sun would cool, the sun would collapse according to the accepted model of the sun, and the earth would cool. It started out very hot, but the laws of thermodynamics allowed him to calculate the number of years, and the estimates varied from 20 million to 400 million, and he refined it. This argument consist went on for a long time. And this was, I mean, 400 million years is a long time, but it wasn't unlimited amounts of time. And this bothered Darwin, and this bothered many of his supporters. And it caused, I mean, Huxley's response was, well, if we only have 400 million years, then that's how long evolution takes. Probably there were saltational changes in addition to gradual changes. And that, I mean, it was all very hazy. Darwin himself never relented, and many of the geologists never relented. They said, no, we think we have more time. But they, they didn't try to argue. Um, it wasn't resolved until the discovery of radioactivity, which slowed the cooling of the Earth and the thermonuclear reactions in the sun, which changed the dynamics of the sun from the, the model Thompson used. Second ch serious challenge to the theory came from mathematicians, and the most notable was a, an eminent engineer named Fleming Jenkin, who argued that natural selection wouldn't work. And his argument was very simple. He said, look, if you have a new type in a population that appears, then the process of blending inheritance would cause that type to be blended in and so you wouldn't, per, the, the new advantageous type would not persist in the population. Now we know about Mendelism, we know that argument isn't valid, but this bothered Darwin greatly. And in later editions of The Origin, he re reverted to a more Lamarckian mode of inheritance. He called it the effect of habit. 
And so where, where in, the, in the first edition of The Origin, it was just straight inheritance. There was no inheritance of acquired characters. Later editions allowed for the inheritance of acquired characters because he needed that to prevent variation from disappearing. The third argument was more subtle and more important to us. It was, it, and Darwin anticipated this, his third objection, and Darwin anticipated this when he discussed what he called organs of extreme perfection. And he used the argument of the I. And he said, and in some detail, although the I is this marvelously complex structure that was used by many people to argue for the perfection of creation by a creator, Darwin said, no, it, it, through a series of improvements, that's the important thing. Every step was an improvement. You can go from the early photoreceptors to various intermediate stages, each of which represent an improvement, a structural improvement on the visual system, which led to the evolution of the modern eye. So he said, all you need to do is, is think about it sufficiently. And if you were lucky, you will find intermediates in nature which tell you that these intermediate stages existed. So there are, are species that simply have crude photoreceptors. And there are species which have photoreceptors with some degree of physical protection, and so on. Now, this argument w works. And Darwin, thought, Darwin liked the argument a lot. The trouble is, it depends on intuition. And it depends on intermediate forms that you think existed, that you think were improvements on previous forms that may not exist today. And it may not be convincing to other people. Your intuition may not be convincing to other people. Pardon? Wikipedia. Uh, but there, you, yeah, there are lots of around. It's, this is a standard introductory biology discussion of the eye. And it, but it does follow our Darwin's verbal discussion. The trouble is when you have, for example, the evolution of flight. Evolution, you, you think, well, you have powered flight with a gener lift generated by muscles. Um, you can envision an intermediate stage where you have gliding but you may feel that the initial stages of gliding uh, may not be a functional improvement. And other people may feel it is. But it's, now it's a question of in intuition. Again, with gliding, you can find flying squirrels and other, or other animals and insects that look like they might be plausible intermediates. Uh, but it depends on intuition. You don't often have, for example, the, the gliding insects. Proto wings in insects and in insect fossils don't look like they're good for gliding. And in fact, Mimi Cole in, in integrative biology has argued that actually they were used for heat regulation and not gliding and only later served the purpose of flight. The trouble is for every major transition, you, all, you have this logical problem. And this has, this has caused some people, this caused people at the time and still caused some people today to argue about the st sufficiency of natural selection. Yes, we know natural selection works most of the time, but is it all the change attributable to natural selection? Is there, or is there something else that can carry you between one adapted, well adapted form and another well adapted form? where the intermediates are not well adapted. Does that never happen? It's very difficult to prove the negative, to say, oh, that never happens. Darwin said it never happens. But people have their favorite characters, their favorite species, and they often have trouble envisioning the, 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 the inter functioning intermediates. And then, as I will explain later, there are mechanisms which cause us to think that maybe the, these steps can be taken in the, uh, without the action of natural selection. So this, this is a, co a continuing discussion in evolutionary biology.
Okay, now we move forward to 1900 and the, real, uh, the rediscovery of Mendelism. And by three people, Hugo de Vries, shown here, and then Shermack and Corenz, roughly simultaneously uh, and roughly independently, rediscovered Mendel's laws of inheritance. And this, of course, led to the, 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 the development of the field of genetics. From our point of view, de Vries is by far the most important because he, does, he not only rediscovered Mendel's laws, but he, did, he just rediscovered them in a species called the evening primrose, shown here. And his Mendelian traits not just were single gene modifications going from wrinkled peas to round peas or tall plants to short plants, the kind of Mendel studied. His mutations were what he called macro mutations. They, several traits at once were inherited in a Mendelian fashion. And this is, uh, this is just one example I found on the web, but there are many, many mutants that de Vries studied which caused one type of plant to, to become something very different, another variety of plant. And so he said not only is this, an, uh, this Mendelism, this is an important me me mechanism of evolution because these macro mutations solve the problem of major transitions. We don't need to have infinitesimally slow changes, each one being an improvement. Instead, we can go in one step from this to this and not worry about having functionally uh, worse intermediate forms because the intermediate forms didn't exist. So de Vries proposed a mechanism, namely macromutation, which is in addition to selection acting on small variation, and he proposed a pattern that some of the major transitions occurred because they were saltational. They were major changes from one form to another allowed by this new mechanism, macromutation. This is only the first in a long series, a century-long series of genetic discoveries that have been proposed as additions to natural selection, transposons, meiotic drive, all these other things one of the first, pa the first papers on each of these said this is in addition to Darwin. And de Vries, for many years, was regarded as the most important evolutionary biologist of his age. Now, it, it, after about 1910, he stopped being so important because it was discovered that his macromutations were the result of ring chromosomes. So they weren't single Mendelian loci, they were chromosomal groups inherited together in a complex way that doesn't occur in most species. It seems to be, it's not unique to evening primroses, but it's, it's very restricted. So he couldn't generalize, and other people couldn't generalize from that. Now, one, after the rediscovery of Mendelism, the it, Mendelism, the inheritance of Mendelian genes, was not immediately accepted as the universal basis for inheritance. Many people, there was a, a group of people in, uh, at the end of the 19th century, Galton, Pearson, um, Weldon, and others, who formed what they called the biometrical school of inheritance, and they invented statistical rules to describe inheritance. Galton discovered regression, he first used regression in this context, and they had, he had a fairly complete statistical theory of inheritance. And the biometricians in particular said, well, look, there are, yes, there are definitely Mendelian genes, but Mendelian genes are not really the stuff of evolution. They are unusual that real inheritance and real in evolution is of continuously varying characters, and this is one of many such pictures where you have the, a uh, distribution of heights of males and females in a, a group of humans. I, guess, I can't quite read the uh, t-shirt. Pardon? I think it's Yukon. Yukon, okay. It's anyway, some, you know, obviously some genetics, introductory genetics class was marched out onto the football field for this purpose. Um, so continuously varying characters were, were the real stuff of evolution and Mendelian genes weren't a part of that. There were two different kinds of inheritance. Now, in 1908, an important year for population genetics, uh, Schull proposed what is called the multifactorial theory. He said, in effect, 
Yes, the, uh, there appears to be continuous traits, but really they're made up of different groups, different genotypes, and each genotype is made up of several Mendelian loci. And so he, this is, this is uh, Schull's statement of the multifactorial theory, and then Lynch and Walsh, Walsh in an important textbook on quantitative genetics explained it in modern terms. And so, this, and so the biometricians and the Mendelians argued for a long time, and they were arguing, of course, about the basis of genetics, but they were also arguing about the genetic basis of evolution. Were there two kinds of inheritance or only one? And gradually the, the, the multifactorial theory gained ground and was finally resolved with a paper by Fisher in 1918. I'll say a little bit more about um, but the biometrical theory, school evolved quickly into what we call the subject of quantitative genetics, which still deals largely with statistical ideas, regression, analysis of variance, um, using the basic tools of biometry, but now giving them an, a genetic interpretation. Now, also in 1918, or 1908, uh, there was an important paper published by G.H. Hardy, very eminent uh, mathematician in England. I, had to, I couldn't resist quoting the, in, the introduction of the paper. I am reluctant to intrude in a discussion concerning matters of which I have no expert knowledge. Would only more people have that modesty. Um, and he also says, I expected everybody to know this, but uh, Punnett in particular, he used to play cricket with Punnett, and Punnett apparently believed that dominant genes would increase in frequency just by virtue of their being dominant. And so Hardy proved what we know as the Hardy-Weinberg uh, result that no, Mendelian inheritance will preserve vari variability on its own. That random mate, what we call random mating, will not result in the loss of genetic variability as Fleming Jenkins and other, others had, uh, had claimed. So Mendelism does resolve this, but only with Hardy. And Weinberg was a, a German physician who derived the same result independently. So after the, uh, well, the, the biometricians, and the, the biometricians basically never gave up, but they did die. And at about the same time, R.A. Fisher published a famous and famously difficult paper which reconciles biometry and Mendelism by showing that all the rules of biometry, regression uh, in particular, and uh, regression involving different d classes of relatives, all could be derived from Mendelism. Um, and so this, this, this paper had a profound effect on the development of genetics because it really eliminated the claim that there had to be two different classes of inheritance. There was really only one class of inheritance, but many characters were multifactorial, and that's why they didn't follow Mendel's simple, simple laws. Okay, after, the, uh, after, the, after 1918, population genetics developed fairly slowly. Only a few people, um, were doing, doing much work, but the ones who were doing it were rather good. Fisher, Sewell Wright, J.B.S. Haldane, and a few others developed what we call, the, what we think of as the foundations of population genetics. Now, Steve Evans and others will talk about this in some detail, but I want to mention just how it fits into the picture of, of Darwinism and, and neo-Darwinism. In the 1920s, Haldane and Fisher spent some time showing that natural selection acting on Mendelian variants could account for slow and gradual evolution. What Haldane specifically showed is that if you consider evolution as a change in allele frequencies, this was a new view where you went from change in phenotype that Darwin considered to a change in allele frequencies, that selection acting on very small differences in average survivorship associated with some allele could produce 
a complete substitution of one allele, allelic type for another in a relatively short time, a few hundred or a few thousand generations. Now, this is something that's obvious to all of us today. You think, well, what was the big deal? Well, the big deal was that this showed that Mendelian inheritance was completely consistent with Darwin's theory of evolution, even if the effect of natural selection was very weak. That is, if the differences created by different genotypes were too small to be obvious to us, so that most people weren't, most organisms weren't dying because they had bad genotypes. Natural selection could still produce changes on, in a few hundred or a few thousand generations much more rapidly than the changes that were observed in the fossil record. So there was no incompatibility between, between Darwinism, Darwin's theory of natural selection, and Mendel's theory of inheritance. So and in the 1920s, Mendelism was incorporated into evolutionary biology and it led to what we, what we, what I'm, what I have been calling neo-Darwinism, or what is sometimes called the modern synthesis. Now, the next, uh, the next step in this is Fisher's book in 1930, called *The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection*, and Fisher proved what he modestly called the fundamental theorem of natural selection. And this theorem, it's, this is, it has been treated with almost uh, Talmudic reverence. Uh, people still write uh, elaborate papers explaining exactly what Fisher meant. And people argue vigorously about exactly what he meant. Um, roughly speaking, what the fundamental theorem says, though, is that natural selection tends to improve a species. The, the mean fitness tends to increase. And by the way, if you have strong feelings about the fundamental theorem, I don't want to hear about them. Um, so, but this confirmed, this was the culmination of the kind of work that Haldane in particular began, and Fisher to some extent began, showing that not only what, could natural selection change allele frequencies, but it changed it overall in the way that Darwin described, that is, species tended to improve. And so the Fisherian view of evolution by natural selection was that very large populations were evolving under the action of natural selection, tending to improve them step by step by step by step, exactly as Darwin described in his book. Now the alternative view, an alternative view, was introduced by Sewell Wright. Sewell Wright wrote a paper, it's published in 1931, um, and he summarized his view of evolution. Now Wright emphasized the role of genetic drift. He emphasized the randomness of the transmission of Mendelian alleles, especially in small populations. And he and Fisher developed the theory of genetic drift in the 1920s. Um, Wright did so using path coefficients. Fisher introduced a diffusion equation that was almost right. Uh, uh, Kolmogorov forward equation. So the theory of genetic drift was developed, and this is, this is Wright's presentation of a lot of what is now absolutely standard population genetics theory, which I won't review. But we also introduced a metaphor for evolution. This was actually from a 1932 paper where he was asked to s present a simple summary of his theory for Congress in genetics held that year. And his view was very different from Fisher's and Darwin's. He said, well, there are local optimum, optima in average fitness. And these local optima were separated by areas for which the average fitness was lower. He called these adaptive peaks and these adaptive valleys. And this is a, a very powerful metaphor that people use all the time in evolutionary biology. And, but it assumes what Darwin said was not true. Namely, that, well, that there were, it, it assumes that there are combinations of traits that go from, that are less well adapted, separating combinations that are better adapted. 
And furthermore, genetic drift was a mechanism to take you from one to the other, from one adaptive peak to the other. And he sketched, this is a hand sketch of his, where he shows that in a large population, you will simply go to the nearest local maximum. But if genetic drift is allowed to work, it can take you from one maximum and carry you to another. He emphasized that this was more likely to happen in subdivided populations where you had lots of local populations that could then send new well-adapted combinations to other populations. That's what this is trying to represent. He called this the shifting balance theory. This is another mechanism that's proposed in addition to Darwin, to Dar uh, natural selection, to take you from one well-adapted suite of characters to another, that is, to cross an adaptive valley. Now, the, the dispute between Darwin and uh, between Wright and Fisher was never really resolved, but by 1940, when this book was published, The Modern Synthesis by Julian Huxley, one of the descendants of Thomas Huxley, there was an established theory summarized by this, and often it was called the modern synthesis after this book. That is, and it, it was Darwinism plus Mendelism. The of course, the fact, nobody doubted the fact of evolution. The pattern of evolution was gradual, but the presentation of the pattern wasn't as dogmatic as Darwin. The rates, rates of evolution varied, and a paleontologist studied in some detail uh, variation in rates of evolution. Uh, natural selection was predominant, but because of Wright's efforts, there was room for the effect of genetic drift. How much room depended on who was reading or who was explaining it. Of course, when Wright explained it, there was a lot of room. When Fisher explained it, there was no room whatsoever. So I think people like Huxley, who, were, who was not a, a, a geneticist or mathematician, uh, just said, well, you know, you guys work it out, and I'll, you know, I will try, you will be tried to be inclusive. Um, okay, so the, the, and the punctuated, uh, the, the neo-Darwinian theory became the predominant theory, the textbook standard for many years. And really the, the, most, the most important challenge to it was by Stephen Jay Gould and Niles Eldridge in a, starting, a paper first published in 1972 and presenting a view of evolution which they called the punctuated equilibrium theory. And roughly speaking, and this, this, is, a, this is an area where people will still argue about it, uh, roughly speaking, they, they contrasted Darwin's pattern of evolution, a gradual, what they called phyletic gradualism, but it's the same as Darwin's gradual theory and, the, and Fisher's gradual theory. And they said, well, no, when you look in the fossil record in detail, as the fossil record got better and better and better, I, I should mention, when Darwin talked about the fossil record, he, for the most part, didn't present detailed evidence of a gradual theory, a gradual pattern of evolution. What he, the, the title of the chapter on the fossil record is, is, is imperfections in the fossil record. That is, if you have a fossil here, and a fossil here, and a fossil here, you can't tell whether it's gradual or not. But what Gould and Eldred said is when you get more and more fossils, you start to fill in a pattern that looks more like this. That there's the state, what they said was the stasis of widespread species. And when new species appear in the fossil record, they, you see a lot of morpho morphological change associated with the appearance of a new species. So the punctuated equilibrium theory was a theory about a generalization about the pattern of evolution. Now many people also said, and other people were somewhat ambiguous on the question of whether this implied there were additional mechanisms to cause the punctuated equilibrium pattern. And some people said, well, yes, this, this looks sudden from the point of view of the fossil record, but this could be 50 or 100,000 years, plenty of time for mass selection to act it's not at all incompatible with neo-Darwinian mechanisms. But other people, this was when transposons uh, had been just discovered, and they were known to be powerful mutagens in Drosophila. Uh, 
Uh, other people said, well, no, but this opens the door for additional mechanisms. This pattern, at least some of the time, might actually reflect, reflect saltational change. And people argued about this vigorously. Uh, my impression is that the argument over the mechanisms have disappeared as, if people, have, as people have found uh, these are the transposons and other genetic mechanisms not to be as powerful agents of change as they thought they might be. And, and, but paleontologists debate about whether the punctuated equilibrium pattern uh, reflects the history of different groups and to what extent it reflects the history. Okay, well that's all I'm going to say about the, the general theory of evolution. And as I say, next in a few minutes, whenever I'm supposed to start, I'll take up more explicit discussions of uh, population genetics. So thank you.